Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, mine website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 22 in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, June the 28th. First, I'll be talking to Scott O'Neill, the founder and director of Rethink Investing, a Sydney-based company which started out as a commercial property buyers agency, which has now become a national company that also works as a residential buyers agency, a property law advisory agency, a mortgage broking and finance company. And I'll talk to EY economist Sherelle Murphy about Australia's latest inflation figures and what these mean to their interest rates. But first, let's talk to Scott O'Neill. Well, Scott, tell us about Rethink Investing. You start as a commercial buyer's agent, but you've branched into into so many different areas now. Yeah, look, we've been in business for about 10 years. And uh, yeah, like like you mentioned, the buyer's agency was the first business, but we just found there was a bit of a gap in the service levels as we went down that vertically integrated model. So the mortgage brokerage, because we were dealing with commercial lending a lot and A lot of the guys and girls that were coming to us as clients had their residential broker. So we needed a specialist in that space and no one really had one, to be honest, back then. And like, well, maybe one in 10 people did, but uh, yeah, it was just filling the gaps one by one. The insurance, you know, you you might think insurance, it's not that special, but if you're buying a purpose-built warehouse facility that's 3,000 square meters and it's got some cold storage facility in there, you actually need to get a survey done and you know you need it's quite a hard thing to get insured so it's not not uh, it's not just getting something off the internet so again it was just one by one trying to fill the gaps so our clients were looked after okay you've you've also got lawyers there too <laughs> yeah same deal um the legal team uh, we needed sophisticated solicitors to carry out the due diligence on leases looking into the history of the tenant Again, this is not a conveyancing model. So you you, don't, you you need an actual solicitor who's qualified to go out and, and represent you. If a tenant doesn't pay, you need to be able to chase them down through the required uh, and, and adequate methods as well. So it was yeah very important to have the right guys on the team. So these are, these are property lawyers. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, property lawyers and essentially they make sure or they all represent the client in their own like. I guess the clients represented by individual businesses. So although they share the Rethink branding, they uh, they're not all uh, they're not working for Rethink. That we're working for the client, just at different angles. So what's the Rethink branding? So Rethink Investing and the Rethink Group is kind of like our I guess our company branding. So it's almost similar to it's a very similar business structure to what the Virgin businesses have gone. So it's it's basically a They've got a common goal, a common set of beliefs and values, and and ours is all around sort of helping clients build wealth. We want to use our knowledge in different aspects for the better of our clients and and really help them build that long-term sustainable wealth. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's about helping them invest smartly, leveraging properly, protecting their assets, and, uh, and yeah, obviously, you back them up with insurance and lawyers so they don't make up mistakes or get caught out as well. What sort of clients do you have? Uh, most of them would be, I guess, I guess something that's probably worth mentioning is like our average, average kind of month at, at Rethink Investing because that's kind of like the largest company, which is where all the properties uh, are purchased on behalf of clients. So we're recording in June this year, but last year in May, oh, sorry, last month rather, so in May, we did 48 transactions. That's 48 properties purchased. And the average deal was about 1.8 mil. So they're generally kind of, I guess our deal ranges from anywhere from say 25 million max down to about a 500 grand. So they're, they're quite, some quite large high net worth individuals or businesses. We deal with family offices, but most people are kind of, I guess if you wanted to average them out, it's like someone who's bought a few houses, they've done well in life, and now they're looking to transition into commercial to uh, to consolidate their passive income goals. Basically, you've got quite a, a distinct clientele there. Yeah, and they're again, they're, they're, our clients are generally quite successful in their own right. So I would class majority of them as high net worth individuals. So 
you know, if, if you if you look at say what a, a fund manager would class them, it's, it's a sophisticated investor is who we're dealing with, and 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 that's that's almost our our day to day in helping them purchase properties at the same level a fund manager would be because we're we're doing all the due diligence for the clients and doing that. They're very busy professionals these guys because they're often got decent or very large businesses behind them and you know they don't want to spend three hours a day trying to understand the commercial market bidding on properties visiting properties like trying to gain access to off-market deals you pay for service and that that's what they do they uh they get us to do all that hard work and leg work and and we're we're there to kind of lower the risk bring them more deals than they would be able to see on their own and then the idea is they do better with us there through purchasing at a lower price, getting a better yield. And then there, uh, I guess our branding in a way is attached to every recommendation. So they know we're not going to be putting risky deals in front of them because the last thing we want as a company is a commercial asset going vacant. And then they're calling us up for the next six months going, how do you fix this? How do you fix that? Like these things happen. It's, it's the real world. It's commercial property. But if it's one in a hundred times or less, far less is, is sort of our track record. That's something very manageable and something clients uh, can deal with. Despite the state of the market now. Yeah, well, this is the great thing about commercial property. You can maneuver around the market as you see fit. So right now we know there's risk in office space, particularly CBD office space. You wouldn't touch a level 30 floor office space with a 10 foot barge pole at the moment. But would you go buy a freehold asset near a capital city airport that's got a logistics tenant in it? Of course you would. You know, these are just, uh, there's just a, a long-term demand for this and and they're backed by the owner-occupier markets. We do lots of little uh, neighborhood shopping centers. Again, the, the market since COVID has supercharged the results there because people like going to their local to, you know, whether it's a bottle a medical center, a chemist, you know, these, you know, the, the supermarket model and that convenience model works well, but would you buy high street fashion right now? In a cost of, uh, you know, when, when inflation is still stubbornly high and cost of living crisis is, is, is really hitting them, I guess the middle income earners the most, that is probably something I wouldn't touch as well. So yeah, you can move around the risks. But since COVID, you've also started investing in medical suites? Yeah, it's a good point. Medical is obviously a recession. Well, I wouldn't say recession proof, but it's close to or very close to. And uh, it's non-discretionary spend is probably the more... Uh, that's that's a more accurate description for it. And uh, the, interestingly, like you know, not just saying everything's great, medical can have its challenges too. So we all know there's uh, a shortage of staff in many industries. They're struggling to to find enough people to fill the required uh, seats needed for some of these businesses. So it, it's obviously just fluctuations in the economy and immigration levels are peaking at the moment. So no doubt there'll be some doctors in that mix, but in general, and these are the things we have to understand when we're recommending someone buy a five, $10 million medical center, we want to do the due diligence on that business and who's there and who's going to replace that tenant. What is the business worth any money in that position? Like, like would they sell it to a, would they sell the, the going concern of the business to someone? But, but yeah, we're, we're finding that that is a good industry when many others are struggling. You're in Sydney, but you, you've branched out nationally. Is that right? That's right. We, we're a Sydney-based operation, but we're, we're scattered all over the country, you know, from Perth to Townsville to Hobart to southeast Queensland. Like, we're all over the place. And um, the key is we, we buy, like, our, with the locals. So, you know, the people that work for me have a lot of them are clients, actually, believe it or not. So I'd say about uh, maybe 25 30% of our workforce is ex-clients because they've invested, they've done very well, and a lot of them walk away from their jobs and they get a little bit bored, you know, so why not stay in the property game and help others, which is exactly what I personally did because uh, I, I built a portfolio, replaced my engineering income a decade ago and, uh, you know, I flew off to Europe and sat there for six months. But once winter hit and everyone went home, you think, what next? And this was a, a fascinating and really enjoyable industry to, uh, to jump into. And, but how do you maintain control of it? I mean, if you're all over the place, all over the country. Again, like this is this is sort of what, since COVID, like, and again, like before COVID as well, I, my wife's half Greek, so getting a bit personal here, but we spend about three to four months in Greece every year. So we fly there, we've got a house there. So we always set the business up so it could run by itself. So that's 
it's generally a combination of splitting the roles, you know, so we've got sales guys that talk to the, um, the clients, we've got acquisition specialists who then network. That's like a B2B role where they're finding deals. Then you've got a due diligence department. So there's those three functions operate almost independently under the banner. And then there's no way one department's going to do the wrong thing because it'll screw the other two departments over for lack of a better word. And it, it balances out. Everyone's got the client's best interests, even if there is a weak link. Like let's say they find a, a property and it's got a high risk uh, and uh, associated to it, then the due diligence team will crash the deal. So we will not proceed on that because it's too high a risk. And, you know, even if the sales guy wanted it to go through, it doesn't go through. So we've kind of engineered some stop gaps that way. So the client's always protected regardless of how much an individual would want it to settle, but uh, it just has to be a good deal. Otherwise it won't go through. But more to the point is this can run by itself, even when you're in Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the only thing that would really like, I, I I'm still on the, on the tools, like I, I'm finding properties daily, you know, I, I generally love that side of the business, you know, talking to you, like, you know, getting the word out about commercial properties, kind of a big part of my job these days and education. Like, you know, that's one of the businesses I didn't mention before. We've got an online education course. It's literally like hundreds of hours of pre-recorded information and live masterclasses and all this, that basically will turn someone who's completely fresh into commercial property. You spend your time doing that, you're going to come out of it very well educated. You'll know exactly what you're looking at. Well, I have to ask you this final question. Where do you see the business in five years' time? Oh, look, we've just expanded into New Zealand. So we're the first Australian buyers agency in, in our history to do that. So I was pretty pretty proud to do that. We've, uh, within a week, we've signed up five or six clients and put a couple of properties under contract. So it's happening quick. So I'd probably like to see if we could do that more in different countries. So more of a little bit of the international expansion. And it's easier said than done because the great thing about Australia is it's one of the best places to invest in real estate on earth. So it's not like we're going to go to Indonesia and start buying all of Indonesia up. Like we've got very limited markets to choose from, but we will be looking for other markets because this one's a, a very tight market. But yeah, just expanding, like we, we control a large market share in our little niche industry, but... Uh, yeah, I'd like just to to just keep moving forward. It doesn't really matter where it ends up as long as there's progress. That's that's the goal. It's not about hitting a end revenue amount or listing on the stock exchange. It's just as long as we're moving forward every year, I'm uh, very content. Well, Scott, that's all fascinating. And thank you so much for your time. You too. Thank you so much. And now let's talk to EY economist Sherelle Murphy. Well, Sherelle, the RBA had some views about inflation yesterday when they kept interest rates at 4.35% and they expressed concern about government spending stoking inflation. Uh, what's yeah. your view about that? Yeah, they certainly um, are clearly still concerned about the way that price growth is growing too quickly. Um, and it is taking some time to get back into its 2 to 3% target band. That is the CPI, of course, coming down to that 2 to 3% target band. There was some conversation about the government measures. And I think that goes beyond the federal government. It includes the recent cost of living measures coming from the state governments. And together, they're clearly putting a little bit of money back in the in the pockets of household. And given we've had some indications recently from the national accounts, which showed that household spending was going a little bit faster than I think they would have anticipated, that does give them some concerns about spending slowing enough to then put down pressure on inflation. So I think, yes, there is this con some concern really that the things are just running a little bit too hot still. It's an issue because the economy is slowing down. And you can see that very clearly. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think the way we need to think about this is the economy has slowed down. And, and partly that's reflecting the fact that the supply side of the economy, if you like, is, is is kind of constrained in many ways. And the slow productivity growth is kind of part of that. There's other constraints in the economy. And I think the construction sector is a really nice tangible example of that. There's plenty of demand there for housing, but the construction sector is struggling to keep up. And so the fact that the supply side of the economy is coming back means that you don't actually need much growth in the economy to still get inflation 
inflationary pressures because essentially demand is, demand is still running above supply, even although demand isn't very fast, it's just hitting that capacity constraint and it's creating that inflation pressure. Well, the latest inflation figures were quite concerning because it showed a services sector was quite strong, the inflation there, uh, particularly yeah. in areas like, say, rents and insurance. That's right. And, that's right. And, I, and I really don't know how that's going to be solved because rent seems to be a structural issue because we have a housing shortage. That's right. And it's, again, that is a really clear reflection of the supply side constraints in the economy. So rents obviously um, are rising because we don't have enough supply relative to demand. Even insurance to some extent is a reflection of the same thing because to supply that insurance is more expensive because of things like climate change. Again, it's a constraint on supply which is which means that you don't need to get much demand before you create those inflationary pressure uh, pressures I should say the rents one you're right I don't think it's going to solve itself quickly and unfortunately that means that there will continue to be strong growth I suspect in rents until supply does pick up but I wouldn't say that's going to be the case forever you know there will be a kind of a structural recovery there eventually, probably, as the supply side kind of recovers. And to the credit, the state governments and the federal government, to some extent, are trying pretty hard here to put some of that supply back into place. And it will eventually correct. But you're right, for the moment and for the sort of at least kind of two-year horizon, it's, it looks pretty, pretty ugly out there. Well, the federal budget had a whole lot of subsidies for yes. electricity and uh, households and rents and everything like that. I suspect the RBA could see right through that in their statement yesterday. Yes, they and, and they used the word it will temporarily bring down prices. In other words, it temporarily, mechanically takes down the CPI, and it does, but they're temporary. And so when they come out again, if nothing else were to change, they'd simply put the CPI back up by almost, not quite exactly, but almost as much as it takes it down. What the government is clearly hoping for is that over the period of time in which the subsidies are in place, other factors start to bring down the CPI. And so you get, uh, I guess, when, when things go back to normal, the underlying core CPI is running at a more normal pace. And so it's, it's less painful at that end. So they're trying to smooth through that period. But it's no, it's not going to fool the RBA in the sense of this doesn't fix the inflation problem, not at all. And in fact, as we've been discussing, it may actually, in, in kind of core term, terms, make it slightly worse. Well, there are some predictions from some economists the RBA might actually force the RBA to actually raise interest rates. What's your view about that? It, it's not outside the realm of possibility. The RBA told us, of course, that they will, that they did talk about the possibility of putting another hike in the cash rate in above to take it above 4.35 percent i think it would it, it's a big ask because we are of course seeing some improvement in the inflation numbers you know they are coming down it's just that they're coming down too slowly and there is reason to believe that the household sector is still transitioning to this level of interest rates because of course those people who were clever enough to take fixed price mortgages back in the, the midst of the pandemic, some of them are still rolling onto the higher rates, higher variable rates as those fixed rates expire. So there is still, if you like, some pain to be felt from the household sector. It is also clear that a lot of the discretionary spending in the household sector has really come back a long way. So things are moving in the right direction. It's just a question of, are they moving fast enough? In other words, is the CPI coming down fast enough? Jury's still out on that. I think they'll probably get there, but certainly if there were upside surprises on inflation, that's when you'd see them move to hike again. This is, this is interesting because the issue is that, I mean, you've got inflation around 3.6, 3.5. It's it's what you call sticky. It's not going mm. up. It's not going down either. And that's mm. an issue for the RBA, isn't it? That's right. Um, and it's very, it's very common in, in cycles when we're going through from a period of high to lower inflation that it takes some time to get there because, you know, service prices in this case are not, de we're not sort of seeing deflation. We saw deflation in goods prices because we know that some of the factors that were causing prices to accelerate were 
due to the pandemic itself. It was stopping the supply of shipping, for example, ports being closed. And so when those factors come out of the equation, you do get that deflation. With services, it's kind of been a bit of a build up and it's been building and there's still you know, relatively strong demand relative to that supply, as we we're talking about before. And so there is no natural impetus, if you like, in the economy for those price growth rates to, to sort of come down other than that you push supply, sorry, you push demand down enough to get it back to where supply is. So how much of an issue is that stickiness for the RBO? It's, it's a big issue because they simply can't settle if we don't see any movement there. They cannot have the rate of inflation sitting above the target band for too much longer. You know, they're told, this, they're told us that they expect it to get back into the band by the second half of 2025. If that doesn't happen, then that would potentially become a trigger for a rate hike because they really need people to believe and to see that they can credibly bring down inflation. If they don't, they lose a lot of their power into the future and they lose a lot of their credibility really is the best word I can use to describe it. And if you don't have a credible central bank that keeps inflation at the target band that it says it will, people don't believe it. They start pricing higher rates into their wage negotiations or businesses might start putting a 4% increase on their prices every year when they're budgeting rather than a 3% or a 2% and it becomes a perpetuating cycle. So that credibility and that need to bring it back down within a reasonable time is absolutely at the forefront of what the Reserve Bank will be concerned about. The wording of the RBA statement actually alluded to that, that it's coming down a lot slower than we expected. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's the margin for error here is small. <laughs> Compared to many central banks around the world, the Reserve Bank has been one of the more patient ones, if you like, in terms of saying we will allow a period of time, quite a long period of time, to get for inflation to get back into the target band. Other central banks were less patient. And of course, the re reason our Reserve Bank said it would be patient is because it doesn't want to slow the economy down so fast that it starts to cause job losses that are perhaps otherwise unnecessary. So what I'm saying here is that the our central bank was already, you know, pushing the limits of the amount of time it was wait, willing to wait before inflation got back down. I don't think it's going to have much more tolerance than to the end of 2025 before it's back in the band. Right. So what we've got another, what, 18 months or so to wait, Sue? Yeah, although the, the RBA doesn't need to actually see it in the 2 to 3% target band before it takes action on the next move, whether it be up or down, as long as it can see what it views as a credible path back there in its forecast, that's good enough. And if it could see it coming back into the target band by that point in time, it could certainly cut rates before it actually gets there. Well, the last set of figures was, of course, uh, monthly, but uh, the big set of figures would be quarterly. Where do you see them heading? Yeah, that's right. So we'll be looking at the the June quarter. Look, there's certainly evidence or a reason to believe that, as you said, a lot of the services prices are not going to be coming down particularly quickly. We will continue to see some volatility in many of the other measures the seasonal food prices, for example, uh, that can, can cause, you know, I guess deflation in prices, very welcome. Any other sort of source of, you know, price defl deflationary pressures might also come through in some other categories. So it is possible we see some of those go down. We also, of course, will see some continued disruption to the numbers from the house, from the government subsidies in and out of that figure from both the Commonwealth and the states. Again, these make it a little bit hard to see a clear number, but I can't see the inflationary problem kind of being fixed, if you like, in the June quarter. I think we're going to have to wait a little further. And then, of course, in the September quarter, we do get a lot of new subsidies in the in the system, particularly the electricity subsidies from the, from the federal government and the states. And, and the other issue, too, is that you've got the tax cuts coming in in July. Yeah, we do. I guess it's important to remember with the tax cuts, though, that it doesn't all, of course, hit at once. It is a gradual kind of improvement in the household bottom line. And also households have been paying a lot more tax over the last two years. So the sort of their share of their budget that's already being devoted to higher taxes has been rising dramatically. And this only gives back a little bit of that. So 
over that kind of period of time, I don't expect that that will be a, a shock factor, if you like, that, that would impact the numbers too harshly. So you don't expect people to sort of go out rushing to spend that money? I don't think so. It certainly doesn't feel like that kind of economy where people would sort of say, well, I'm just going to bank that whole year of tax cuts and, uh, you know, take a nice little uh, uh, mini break and uh, blow it all. It doesn't, we're not in that kind of economy at all at the moment. People are much more cautious and we can see that in the consumer sentiment numbers. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll wait and see. We'll wait to see what the quarterly numbers tell us. Yes, July. it's going to be a big, a big release uh, end of July. Very, very telling for the, the, I guess, the momentum in prices as it has evolved over the first half of the year and will be really important to the Reserve Bank's meeting in, in August. Okay, well, we'll watch that with great fascination. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, Australia's monthly inflation rate increased to its highest level in 2024 in the latest indication that the Reserve Bank won't be cutting interest rates soon and might yet hike again. Consumer prices rose 4% last month from a year earlier, the Australian Bureau of Statistics said on Wednesday. That compared with the 3.6% pace recorded for April and the 3.8% rate expected for May by economists. The annual trim mean inflation was 4.4% in May, up from 4.1% in April. The monthly inflation figures are less complete than the quarterly ones which won't land until the 31st of July. The RBA expects a quarterly inflation pace will accelerate to 3.8% in the April-June period from 3.6% in the March quarter. And Coles and Woolies face mandatory fines under a new mandatory code. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has agreed to a mandatory food and grocery code of conduct, paving the way for multi-billion dollar fines for the supermarket giants in a move that could cause apprehension in the business community. Dr Chalmers said the government would also adopt all 11 recommendations for review into the code undertaken by former Labor Cabinet Minister Craig Emerson. In addition to making the code mandatory, Dr Emerson recommended stiff penalties of up to $5.2 billion for the largest chains, stronger protections for supermarket retribution, an anonymous complaints process managed by the competition watchdog, and new avenues for mediation and arbitration. The supermarket duopoly in Coles and Woolworths control about 65% of the supermarket sector and have garnered lion's share of complaints about supermarket abuse, price gouging and misleading conduct. This is about getting a fair go for families and a fair go for farmers, Dr Chalmers said. We're cracking down on anti-competitive behaviour in supermarkets so people get fairer prices at the checkout. Dr Emerson's interim report in April was welcomed by groups including the National Farmers Federation, while the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry gave cautious support arguing it was important the new code did not create an expectation of equivalent regulatory moves in other areas of the economy where there was a similar concentration of market power. Labor will move swiftly to introduce legislation implementing the changes in a bid to dull public anger over rising food and grocery prices and supplier anger over alleged abuses of market power. And Anthony Albanese has escalated his campaign against nuclear power by appointing Matt Keane to chair the Climate Change Authority, with the former New South Wales Liberal Treasurer and Energy Minister declaring he had rejected nuclear technology because he didn't want to bankrupt Australia's most populous state. Coalition MPs said there was a sense of utter shock in the New South Wales Liberal Division because Mr Keane had created the impression he was going to do something commercial, and they called him a traitor. Former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce accused Mr Keane of being consistently treacherous and said he should have joined the Labor Party at the start of his political career. Mr Keane, however, said that as State Energy Minister, he considered how to replace the capacity of four retiring coal-fired power stations by 2030 and ruled out nuclear based on economics and engineering. The advice that I received at the time, which was most compelling, was from the Chief Scientist of New South Wales, Professor Hughes Durant-White, he said. His advice to me was, in order to bring nuclear into the system, it would take far too long and would be far too expensive for New South Wales. I didn't want to bankrupt the state, and I don't want to put those huge costs onto families. The Prime Minister, who said he had no plans whatsoever to repeal John Howard's federal moratorium on nuclear, said Mr Keane understood that the folly that walking away from renewables transition represents for our nation. As the coalition ramped up pressure on Labor to reveal the cost of its clean energy transition, Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen revealed he had hand-picked Mr Keane and made the recommendation to Mr Albanese in Cabinet because he was the best for the job. And in further escalation of the nuclear debate, former Prime Minister Mr Paul Keating has launched an attack on opposition leader Peter Dutton, labelling him a charlatan and an inveterate climate change nihilist over his support for nuclear energy. Mr Dutton responded by labelling the comments a petulant outburst and cited Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's recent suggestion that Mr Keating's statements 
on foreign affairs were unfortunate. Former Prime Minister accused the coalition leader of, of seeking to camouflage long-held climate denialism with a nuclear fantasy, the most dangerous and expensive energy source on the face of the earth. Dutton, like Abbott, will do everything he can to delegitimize renewables and stand in the way of their use as a remedy nature has given us to underwrite our life on earth, Mr Keating said in a statement on Sunday. Only the most wicked and cynical of individuals who would voice such a blight on an earnest community like Australia. The former Labour leader's comments highlight the ramping up of rhetoric occurring ahead of the next federal election, with both sides honing their attack lines and whittling down the key issues. Mr Keating's broadside comes after Mr Dutton over the weekend accused Mr Albanese of being a child in a man's body in a speech to the Liberal Party Federal Council. The coalition last week unveiled aspirations to build seven nuclear power stations by 2050, with the first producing electricity by 2035 if it was a small modular reactor, or 2037 if a larger plant was found to be the best option. The opposition has argued nuclear plants will help Australia achieve net zero by 2050, but said it would scrap Labor's interim 2030 targets. The plants would be paid for and operated with taxpayer money. The plan has united clean energy groups in angry opposition and raised concerns among business about delaying the energy transition by creating uncertainty about the net zero pathway. And Seven West Media Chief Executive Jeff Howard has lost some of his most senior lieutenants, including the Head of Sport and Chief Revenue officer as he attempts to reduce the company's cot space. Kurt Burnett, Chief Revenue Officer, and Lewis Martin, Head of Sport and Managing Director of Seven Melbourne, are the high-profile exit of the media company controlled by billionaire Kerry Stokes. Chief Marketing Officer Melissa Hopkins will also depart the business. Mr Burnett has worked for Seven since 1990 when he began as a sales assistant. Mr Martin joined in 1994 as a sales executive. Ms Hopkins, who is also Chief Audience Officer, joined Seven last May. Seven West owns the Seven Network and Perth, the West Australian. Applications for voluntary redundancy at the West began last week, but the job cuts are not limited to the publishing division. The redundancies are in response to a Seven West commercial deal with Facebook and Instagram owner Meta, estimated at $15 million annually, expiring at the end of this week. Seven is more vulnerable than its competitors to weaker market conditions, with free-to-air television advertising constituting nearly 90% of its total revenue. The advertising market continues to face challenges. Guideline SMI figures for April indicate a 10.4% decline overall compared to the same period in 2023. Revenue for calendar year 2023 was also down 10% compared to the previous year. Morningstar analyst Brian Hand said last week the structural challenges facing the free-to-air television and broadcasting video on-demand industries would hinder Seven's ability to grow its profit margin. And Australian households are saving much less than their global peers as mortgage repayments and tax bracket creep into disposable incomes, new research shows. But a sharper than expected deterioration in the jobs market could force shoppers to cut back on spending even further and save more. The research from RBC economists Su Ling Ong and Robert Thompson comes as economists to debate the extent to which households will save or spend the $23 billion a year stage 3 income tax cuts from July the 1st. Spending of the tax cuts could keep upward pressure on inflation, delaying interest rate cuts or even forcing another rate rise by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Households save just 0.9% of their disposable incomes in three months to March, which was about 5.8 percentage points below the pre-pandemic average, RPC estimated. Fall in the savings rate means Australian consumers are stashing away much less of their income than their advanced economy peers, many of whom are saving more than they were before the onset of COVID-19. While saving and spending tend to have an inverse relationship, Ms Ong said, the past few years it had been an unusual time when both the savings rate and consumption growth had moved in the same direction, lower. This slightly reflects the unusual period of negative real household disposable income for a sustained period. Households have accordingly saved less as well as spent less, she said. While the Australian Bureau of Statistics revised consumer spending figures are higher in the March quarter national accounts, annual growth in household consumption was still a soft 1.3%. And pharmacists have labelled as an insulting the Albanese government's deal with the Greens to make pharmacies the sole supplier of vapes, saying they're not tobacconists or garbage collectors. Health Minister Mark Butler on Monday backflipped on plans to mandate doctors' prescriptions for all vape sales, but said the government would still limit their sale to pharmacies under the changes that would come into effect on October the 1st, anyone over 18 who can currently buy vapes would still be able to do so, but only from a pharmacy, while those under 18 would need a prescription from a doctor. Labor argues a lack of action on e-cigarettes would enable a new generation of 
nicotine addicts amid proliferation of products targeted at young people, including flavoured vapes. Under the new laws, vapes will be regulated as a Schedule 3 pharmacist-only medication and be subject to plain packaging rules. As a Schedule 3 product, anyone purchasing a vape will have to show ID to prove their age and talk to the pharmacist who will provide professional advice about the use of vapes. Limitations will also be placed on the concentration of nicotine available. Vaping products for sale in pharmacies will have to meet product standards and seek approval and permission from the Office of Drug Control to be able to be lawfully sold in Australia. Green's health spokesman, Jordan Steele John, said his partner did not support prohibition and so it sought changes that would allow vapes to continue to be purchased by anyone over 18 from a pharmacy. And cash transporter Armagard has sealed an agreement with the country's largest banks and retailers to deliver the Linfox Control Group an additional $50 million, assuring the distribution of banknotes and coins throughout the economy for at least a year. This is good news for now for those Australians who still use cash. The distribution of banknotes and coins through the country face an uncertain future when an earlier attempt in April to bail out the Trouble Armour Guard collapsed. While use of cash is down to about 13% of transactions in Australia, access to it is vital for those who rely on it, including people in regional areas with poor connectivity, people without digital skills, and those who consider cash more reliable. For this reason, major businesses such as the large retailers who use Armour Guard service rely on a cash and transit service. The new agreement, finalised over the weekend, will provide additional funding for Armour Guard for a year from July the 1st. Plunging cash use has squeezed Armour Guard's profit because it operates under contracts that link revenue to volume while fixed costs remain high. In many European countries, cash has been designated an essential service and is regulated by central banks. The $50 million injection will be funded by Armour Guard's biggest customers, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, National Australia Bank, ANZ, Coles, Woolworths, Bunnings and Australia Post. The funding will be contingent on the struggling company, a subsidiary of the trucking empire of billionaire Lindsay Fox, heading efficiency and restructuring milestones to put it on more sustainable financial footing. The transaction was negotiated by former union heavyweight and Linfox director Bill Kelty, Linfox executive chairman Peter Fox and Armagud CEO Mick Cronin. The ABA team was led by its chairman and NAB boss Andrew Irvine, CEO Anna Belight and head of policy Chris Taylor. And Maya would purchase Just Jeans, JJ's and a number of other well-known brands owned by Premier Investment under a proposal from the department store that would mark the biggest shake-up of billionaire businessman Solomon Liu's retail empire in nearly two decades. This would give Liu a seat on the board of the department store giant and bolster Maya's loyalty program. The proposal is part of a broader strategic review being conducted by Maya's new executive chairwoman, Olivia Wu. Under the plan, the department store would acquire Premier Apparel Brands Division, which also owned Portman, Jackie E and Dotty brand in exchange for new shares. Premier, which is controlled by Mr. Liu, owns around 31% of Maya. He would own just 30% of Maya should the transaction proceed. Ms. Worth, the former chief executive of Qantas Loyalty, was appointed executive chair of Maya in March. Her arrival has put focus on its Maya One loyalty program and the potential to grow profit through more online sales and an expanded roster of private label brands. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Deborah Rathchen, the CEO of biotech firm Carina, an Australian clinical stage immunotherapy company researching and developing CAR-T therapy for personalised cancer immunotherapy treatment. And I'll talk to economist Nicholas Gruyan about why Australia's anti-corruption watchdog and the Public Service Commission took no action over the RoboDebt Commission's findings on the scandal. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from our website, leongetler.com. If you like Talking Business, please leave us a review with Apple Podcasts. Thank you in advance. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Also, in my copious spare time, I have a copywriting business. If anyone needs newsletters, blogs, articles or advertorial, email me. Wishing you all a safe and healthy week and looking forward to bringing you talking business next week.